Hello everyone and welcome to Healing Arts London. This is the second day of this global response to what's being called the mirror pandemic, which is this mental health crisis that's emerged as part of COVID-19. And today it's Artist House Calls, which is this series of conversations that I'm having with mostly artists, although there's an architect too, and in fact a former British politician who's now a prison chaplain. Um, and it's about the nature of creation in confinement. And so all of the kind of issues that have faced these people over the course of this year. Hello, Ben. Welcome to my humble studio. It's great to see you, Ragnar. How are you doing? Just really, as, as they say in Russia, normal. Well, normal's pretty good for these days. You know, normal, normal's <laughs> something, something to aspire to, quite frankly. Absolutely. Now, Ragnar, are you in a studio or a museum? I'm in my studio in Reykjavik. But what's going on in the background there? Because that doesn't look like a, no a normal studio. <laughs> it's like a, it's, a, it's a, actually a set. I was making a video piece. Uh, which is set in a museum in Moscow in 1913, in the Tretyakov in 1913. And uh, so, and you know, I, I did it last year, but I haven't taken it down because it's a pretty cool sum, sum background. <laughs> that here I can, you know, like, it's really like I'm in some palace, you know, like, oh yes. Well, exactly, yeah. Down. So let, let's talk about like, because this, is, this series is called Creation in Confinement. So tell us about, so did you, obviously you had this around you, but how, how you know, um, how confined were you? How isolated were you in the coronavirus period? Iceland has not been that dramatic. I mean, it has been under lockdown, but, uh, but I mean, there has been periods when you kind of only just see your closest family, but you know, like restaurants have never really closed and stores never really closed. So the scale here in Iceland has been so much more nice in comparison to, it's almost like a lovely mood, you know, kind of lovely calm mood. It's like, so it's a weird thing about living in an island, you know, in the middle of the ocean. I mean, of course, things have changed and, and, uh, and uh, it's actually very kind of humanizing effect, I think, to, to kind of be confronted with yourself and not like always running away in a jet plane that must have been a massive thing because you are you know you're very much an artist who's you know for instance working with the national in the states for instance we have i mean we have actually been collaborating but uh like uh just you know just zooming and on the telephone and and uh so, so i've been i've been working with with my with my friends you know like you surely but you know but also like everybody's starting to be kind of easy with this form of communication like we're doing now so like so i i've been you know i've been in kind of a very collaborative mood i would say I, w I wanted to talk to you about the work that you submitted for this auction at christie's because it's 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 part of a body of work which seems to me to be to speak to our time very powerfully because it's this series called figures in a landscape so tell us about it yeah it was a commission by the the medical faculty of the uh, of the of Copenhagen University, and they were building this new building in the university, which is uh, called Mersk Tower, and they actually commissioned a video piece for it. And uh, and I was and I was thinking very much about you know like whoa, it's a piece in a in a medical faculty of a university. I was, there's a sweet spot in the in the big hospital here in Reykjavik. I once went there with a friend to look at when there's the shift change. When, you know, people in white robes leave and other, others come in. And it's just so beautiful. It's really like you kind of see these people put on the angel costume and just like, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna save some lives here. And, uh, and also just, I really love the idea of the, of, the, of the white robe as this kind of humanist symbol of, uh, of unity in a way it's like is the only kind of totally cross-cultural thing that actually unifies us i mean it's not a religious costume it's just a costume of it's a cross costume of care progress and science and uh so so therefore i yeah i was very much into those kind of 1930s ideas of progress and science and and beauty and uh 
of course, it was a little bit ironic, you know, it's like, it's quite funny, those works, you know, when you come into a hospital and there's an intimidating work of the heroism. I and mean, it must have felt really strange, though, at the same time that here you were working on that project in 2019, and then in 2020, suddenly the heroism of health workers is like front page news, you know, it's, so it's almost like that sort of the idea of predicting a future was suddenly sort of you were thrust into that future sort of immediately. Yeah, I remember I was sort of embarrassed about because I, I have this deep respect for health workers. And uh, and I, I wanted this to be an homage. But like, as I said, always when I do a homage, always when I love something, I also, there's always a bit of irony in it too, you know. I know your work is bittersweet in, to a certain degree. But I know that through having spoken to so many people about the visitors, for instance, that people come out of that work having this tremendous sort of sense of, of, of a kind of catharsis, of a kind of almost like a healing experience. Can you tell us something about those conflicting emotions and this process of a kind of like a healing process? Yeah, I almost think like these kind of conflicting emotions are like, are kind of the essence of, you know, kind of the healing process of art. You know, it's like, it's, you know, like a sad, a terribly sad song by, glue sniffing towns van zant makes me happy <laughs> you know <laughs> but happy songs are are i think happy songs are more uh, i think they are more difficult in many ways to deal with because we have i think we are pretty unsatisfied and unhappy as on the general i connect more with uh with the sad songs you know i don't do artwork just to to make myself or audience feel better it's like it's about it's about kind of you know, looking into the abyss and kind of, and seeing all those uh, conflicting emotions that, that are surrounding us and, and kind of trying to deal with them as an artist. I think that is the kick of being an artist, really. Yeah. It's, it's, it's extraordinary, that sort of communion, isn't it, between the, the viewer and the artwork? I think every day I put this Billie Holiday recording from her last album. You know, I'm a fool to love you. It's just like... <gasps> And you read about that, she kind of just, you know, she was just like crying when she was singing it. It's, and it's under this like super glamorous kind of satin, velvety uh, string arrangement. And it's just so full of sadness. And, and I don't know what it is telling me, but it's just like, it makes me really feel better every day. <laughs> yeah, that's extraordinary. And, 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 and in a way you've made so much art precisely in that area haven't you i mean you know there's uh, the work called god which has that you know sorrow conquers happiness is the is that repeated chant and yet there's that sort of gorgeous lushness about that work and that's obviously a deliberate setup that you created there. In that piece, I was really trying to channel that sort of like Billie Holiday, Frank Sinatra, sort of Nelson Riddle, like not King Cole, you know, what do you call it? Like, it's almost like, it's kind of like syrup made of sugar and heroin, like. I wondered how much of like the positive feeling emerges from that collaborative spirit that that we've mentioned, you know, that that so, I remember you telling me once that, that that you just have this urge when you meet people, you think I've got to work with this person. I find it very similar to like when you were like, just like idling around as a kid and you know, there's a new kid on the street and you think she's cool and you go like, hey, you wanna, <laughs> well, should we play dolls or, you know, like what? <laughs> it's very, it's very similar to that. You just like, I think collaboration is almost like a, there's like this kind of youth, youthful element to it. It's almost like come out and play feeling to it, which, which I'm just totally hooked on. I like, you know, I, when often when I'm like, you know, working alone or like doing a painting, I just like, I call a friend and, you know, can you help me with the eyes? Can you help me paint, finish painting the eyes? You know, what's the best part of art for you in a way? Is it, is it the, the process, the idea, the development, being in that studio you're in now and, 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 ha and just sort of engaging fundamentally with ideas? Or is it then, is it completing that and then bringing it into the world? 
It's the cocktail party. It's definitely the cocktail party. <laughs> I miss the cocktail party. <laughs> I mean, one of the things, again, about your work that I've found is it is a very social experience. And, you know, it, it, there was a show that particularly at the Barbican a few years back in London, where it was it was absolutely encouraged that, that people were you, you were in and amongst the works. There's the work called Take Me Here by the Dishwasher, where you have these performers who are within the space of the audience. And so the yeah. audience is, is so directly confronted with the art, they cannot not sort of be immersed in it to a degree. And that seems to me to be hugely important in your work generally. Yeah, it's. Uh, I really like it when there's this. Um, when there is no difference between the arty stuff and the, the real stuff. You know, I, I always just like the reality of art and art making. But it's just like a, that it isn't as magical as we think. But there is so much created. Going back to figures in a landscape, there's there's a sort of there's an unavoidable connection between a kind of yes, between medicine, but also medicine in the world. It's unavoidably a portrait of the world and the environment. You are addressing kind of the breadth of global issues, but in a kind of, in a kind of way that feels like talking, like having a conversation with somebody as opposed to, as opposed to talking about an issue. Art is not only nice, art, art can be very dangerous too, you know, and, uh, and therefore, therefore like, I think I'm very, I'm always just thinking about the human condition living. You think a lot about the environmental issues and political issues and, and uh, gender and race issues. It's like, it's all there, but you know, like it kind of goes into the works in a very weird way. <laughs> it never goes like directly into it. So I wanted to, I wanted to end by talking about a situation in, in which an artwork has created that kind of healing effect, that extraordinary healing effect that you were thinking of before. So when you've been so touched or moved by something, by a work of art, can you think of a particular example where it's had that kind of effect on you? Yeah, there are like so many examples. I always go back to this painting by Rosalba Carrera. This, she was an, uh, 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 she was an 18th century Venetian pastel painter. And I once saw this painting of a girl holding a monkey. I just always go, like always, when I must, something like that, I just think of that painting. I don't know, it just stays with me. It's just so kind of human and vulnerable and beautiful. Well, that's, a, that's, a, that's a lovely Rococo image to end on. Very appropriate for you, yes. Ragnar. Thank you so much. It's, it's been <laughs> great to talk. Thank you so much. Get up! Hi, Ben. Thanks so much for coming. Well, hi. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's so exciting to see uh, see the wall behind you. We can see that you're surrounded by your own paintings. Where are you? I'm in the Askew Hospital ward and in the courtyard where we're painting. Um, and there are three big paintings around the courtyard. So tell us what, what we can see, because I, I'm seeing a sort of landscape with figures. Yes, they are landscapes and nature, um, but nature made strange. And because the courtyard is quite um, grim in a sense, so I wanted to bring some radiance in. So this series of people traveling through landscape, that's a kind of idea of narrative, in, people in time, and people kind of evolving. They're a disheveled little group. That's really interesting, because you've spoken about the mural that you did in Exeter at this place called the Junipers, which was in, you know, a, a psychiatric healthcare setting. Can you say more about that? Because I think that's really interesting in terms of the kind of art that one makes around people that have um, mental illness. Well, I've always found that art that deals with suffering is, is quite consoling in a way. Um, when I was much younger, I found T.S. Eliot and Francis Bacon consoling precisely because they went down into the depths. Um, and so I feel that making work for people in situations where they are struggling or in difficulty, it shouldn't be too saccharine or um, sentimental or ignoring the dark side of things. And also there's that sense of a journey, isn't there? I mean, that's really crucial in both that project and this one that you're working on now, is that you're, there is a progress towards that light that you're talking about. 
I was always taken with the figure of the wanderer. So I think that has got into my work from literary studies. And essentially, you know, you're in a courtyard, so you're creating a kind of contemplative space. Yes, I mean, the, the opposite, the paintings, there's a bench and there's a table and chair just to my right. So hopefully they can, people can sit and have a cigarette or something and, and think about them or, or maybe enjoy the colours as a contrast to, to what's going on above. One of the reasons that Hospital Rooms is such an effective programme is because it's about often turning what, what are quite grim spaces and, and art can illuminate these quite literally, can not it? Yes, it brings them to life. It opens up corridors and walls to um, imaginative vistas. It, it shakes people's imaginations. I mean, I think art, art can do this, making people aware of possibility, making people aware that there's something fathomless riches inside them and that they're not stuck, they're not empty, they're not um, in this state of boredom and zestlessness. There's looking at art or doing art help, can help people if they're suffering. And you've even you've led workshops, haven't you? You did a, a dog painting workshop for hospital rooms, for instance. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we did a starry night workshop. Um, and also a light workshop, light and shadow at different times of the day. And then the dog in light, the dog casting shadow and illuminated <laughs> in sunshine. This one subtitle of this series is, is about creation and in confinement and about, and, and about isolation. And it, right the way through your work, there, have been, there has been this sort of figure in nature or in, in the urban environment. And that's... Um, both in some ways a kind of powerful image, but also a vulnerable image, right? Yes, yes, I suppose they're struggling, but they are winning through in a way, or they're carrying on. <laughs> fail again, fail better. I wanted to talk about your own personal isolations. In the COVID-19 series that you did, C19, you, you made those works on the kitchen table using cardboard that was the material from boxes from deliveries like we've all been getting. It was a very... It was a very sort of archetypal experience of the confinement that, that we've all been through during the COVID-19 pandemic. Artists can be, writers can be animated by bad times. You know, they, they like, we like to, to make work about um, dark matter. <laughs> I found that I really did respond to this this grim situation and all the cells and the viruses floating around and in, in the pictures and um, uh, and I liked transforming as often I like metamorphosis transforming um, the doctors into my own figures that are ambivalent they're both I mean they're obviously heroic and good and helpful, but they're also rather alarming. And there's a sort of borderline space where the patient is confronting an alarming alien world of the doctor in this terrifying plague doctor's outfit with the, the visor and so on. One questions not just the mental health of the um, the patient as they are facing these figures, as you say, but also the doctors, the healthcare workers themselves, who are incarcerated, as it, if you like, within these costumes that they have to be in order to protect themselves, and their own experience of that and how that affects their, their own mental health. Yes, well, that's been very acute. And I did um, a thing actually on Zoom with a girl called Monique Jackson, who does a thing on Instagram called Corona Diary about her struggle with long COVID. And she and I and a doctor called Dr. Priyan Odedra, who does photography, talked about all this. And he on the front line was saying precisely what you're saying about the appalling strain and, 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 and the distress of his colleagues at seeing what they saw and not being able to save people and so on. You know, we, we've all heard about it. Can you think of an example in your own life where art has provided you a kind of solace or catharsis or have somehow um, helped you in terms of your health? As a, a teenager suffering from boredom and depression, I loved <laughs> three particular books. It was Camus L'Etranger, it was Sartre's Nausea, 
and there was Sylvia Plath's Bell Jar, and then again T.S. Eliot's Wasteland, and they all spoke of um, very, um, very unpleasant, sad experiences, but reading them and feeling less alone through reading them, you realise that other people are going through similar things, and it's very, it's very cheering. And um, there's a quote I, I like um, by Iris Murdoch, which says, great art exhilarates without consoling. And the books that I really enjoyed at this stage, they certainly weren't consoling, but I found them exhilarating because art, writing, painting, transforms things into, gives them energy, gives them shape, makes you feel, as I said, less isolated in your own state. What have you turned to during the pandemic? Have there been particular works or particular writings that you have found particular solace in during this last year? I've been reading Dante, <laughs> um, The Journey, <laughs> um, The Inferno. I was doing some pictures of swamps and I was thinking of his river Styx as like a swamp where things are obviously rather revolting and moribund, but they're also, <laughs> it's like an alchemical soup where things are being created or turned into a new life, perhaps. Obviously, in, in recent years, art has become particularly associated with the market. And um, one of the things that is interesting to me is about what art's social role is after the pandemic, because, you know, you're there making a work of art directly in a, you know, a space for people. And I wonder about what you think about how art's role might shift now, because it is that essential connection that we've just been talking about. Because the markets had to step back a bit, um, maybe artists and art, artists and the public have re-established a connection, even though it's difficult at the moment. But maybe when we're all released, that that connection will will be um, fruitful in a way that it perhaps wasn't before. Um, and one of the good things for me about working with hospital rooms is to feel that maybe you are making a difference because working away in a studio and having shows and stuff you sometimes think well you are in this bubble and maybe I don't know you don't not making much of a difference to people um, but from working here and doing workshops and doing that thing that I was talking about making people feel that there's something within them they can bring to life um, is very um, invigorating for artists, I think. And I like the idea of, because of the pandemic, throwing up all these things about how we've abused nature. And so there's this renewed awareness of, um, of the environment through the pandemic, and art is, because art and nature are connected, partly, art is, I think, trying to come to the rescue a bit. I mean, many people are, but art's playing its part, I think. Well, it's, it's really important that you brought up the environment because because the World Health Organization itself says that, you know, this is, of course, about an urgent mental health crisis of this moment, but also that it connects to societal health and environmental health. It's very much an intersectional problem. And do you think art has the capacity to speak to all of that? Maybe I'm glamorising artists, but I think artists have always been aware of extreme states of mind, um, some quite profound and possibly troubling ideas. And I think so there's, there's a great, potentially a community between artists and people suffering with mental health issues, wherever they might be. And I think artists also, I think from what I've already said, have a possible way out of it through creativity, through releasing people's creativity through giving them starting points. Indeed. Well, Susie, thank you so much for talking to us today. It's been a, it's been a wonderful conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ben. So now, now I'm handing over to Tim Wright, who's coming to, to speak to you. Thanks so much. All right, bye-bye. Hi, hi, Tim. So it's nice to have a chance to talk to you. I've, I've been talking to Susie about the, the vital role that artists can play in, in connecting people with mental health problems and, uh, and, and this wonderful thing that is art and, and, the, and the realms of the imagination. Can you say something about, about how hospital rooms can, can make these uh, connections happen? There's 
a number of ways. Uh, one is through the art that they install in, in, in the uh, mental, in mental health units, um, and that is art that's been arrived at through a consultation process with both patients and staff and managers to try and calibrate it to be something that's going to fit with the environment, with the particular bits of the environment, whether it's the courtyard or the gym or the dining area or, or, or the lounge or whatever it is. And there's also that process that I mentioned of, of consultation that involves workshops uh, for patients on the ward and workshops for staff on the ward. So that's part of kind of getting people's imaginations going, getting people involved in the, in the art process. You're, stand, you're in that courtyard now and you've got Susie's work around you. It must be wonderful seeing these works come to fruition. Yeah, it's lovely. I mean, I've only ever seen Susie's work on a screen before, actually. So it's lovely to see it, um, and, and obviously at this scale as well, this sort of uh, virtually abstract expressionist scale of these, uh, of these murals. It's, it, it, it's lovely. Great. Well, thanks for giving us this behind-the-scenes access, and, and thanks for talking to us. Thank you. Cheers. 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 Hello, Ben. Hello. Hello, Jonathan. How are you? Good to be with you. Jonathan, UK viewers might know something about you, but there, there are, there's an international audience today. So I wonder if you might just say who you are and, and what, what your connection is to prisons and why you're particularly concerned about this subject. My name's Jonathan Aitken, and I'm a prison chaplain at Pentonville Prison, which is something of an iconic prison in London and in Britain, because it's one of the oldest prisons it's over 178 years old. It's a very um, antiquated, run-down uh, prison, partly because of its age. Its uh, infrastructure is crumbling, but it's one of the big London prisons, and it houses uh, at any one time about 1,300 prisoners, and they're in pretty cramped and overcrowded conditions, which is, I'm afraid, not abnormal. Can you say something about, I mean, this is obviously about creation in confinement and in your experience working with prisoners, what access do they have to creativity? The answer is they have precious little access to any kind of creativity. Uh, the facilities for art, say, and creativity are woefully absent. There are spaces in the prison which you could use for that purpose, but the kind of thing we're talking about uh, for healing arts um, creative sculptures or paintings or artwork, um, it just ain't there at all. Prisons, apart from anything else, are notorious places for mental health problems. Mental health can stretch from people who are suicidal uh, to people who are schizophrenic, right down to what is a very common problem, um, a lot of anxiety, a lot of depression, and there's not much mental health um, treatment for these people. They're really left most of the time just to get on with it. Uh, so something like an opportunity to do artwork or an opportunity just to see um, murals, uh, this would lift the morale and the mood of the prison. And for some individual prisoners who were encouraged to come and do artwork and t taught artwork, I think it would be a game changer in their lives. Right. And, and have you had discussions with the people that run the prison about the possibility of instituting programmes like this? Would they be welcoming to it? And what can be done about that? In Pentonville, we've got a very good governor and an imaginative management team. And I have discussed this project with them and they are warmly welcoming. They would love to have uh, murals on their ugly, empty walls. They absolutely see the point. Unfortunately, it doesn't have a budget to do it, which is uh, a very big problem. I wonder if right. I might, at this point, bring in, um, to join this discussion, a former prisoner in Pendrill. He's become a rather friend of mine. His name is Dan Brown, and he's coming to our screen now. Hi, Dan. Hi, Dan. Nice to, nice to meet you. Please tell Ben Luke, who's interviewing us, um, why you were in Pendrill. I uh, became uh, involved with... Uh, Pentonville uh, when I started taking uh, drinking drugs to uh, cope with my dad having a stroke, he needed dying in my arms. 
Uh, rather than uh, seek professional help, I chose obviously the quick, easy fix at the time, which I thought would work, uh, which it didn't obviously. Drinking drugs don't work. They just uh, cover it over like a plaster. And uh, I started uh, committing crime, obviously stealing alcohol from shops. Uh, it then escalated to uh, me pulling out knives to rob the shops. And uh, obviously, rightly so, I got my ass slapped and put in Pentagon. Of the last 10 years, how many of them have you spent in prison? Seven. So I've spent seven Christmases, seven birthdays, which is uh, which has been brutal, if I'm being honest with you. That's one of the things I wanted to ask you about, is it, you know, because we're talking about, you know, access to creativity inside. And I wonder if you, you know, when you were inside, were you, I'm sure you would have wanted to do things to keep you occupied and to, and to, and to let your imagination be expanded, I guess. Uh, did you did you get offered those activities? Were you able to, to be creative inside? If I'm being brutally honest, the regime for me was basically one hour a day out of your cell. So you're spending 23 hours in a, in a, in a cell no bigger than a toilet room or a bunk bed. And uh, most of the time you've either got a cellmate, it's either taking drugs, getting out of his face, you know, and as you can imagine, somebody that's trying to come off drugs, <laughs> it's not the best uh, environment, you know. Uh, I've been in cells where you've got no windows, so it's open to the to the cold weather, no heating, sometimes no even running water, you know. And uh, when you ask to do stuff, they just brush it off, you know. I mean, there's not a lot of uh, investment in Pentonville. I mean, it's crumbling, you've got cockroaches in your cell, you know, mice, that's, 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 that's just a normal. You know, sometimes you even get uh, leaking water from the roof because uh, the pipes are burst, you know, and uh, it's like, uh, even if you want to paint this cell, make it a bit more bearable, you know, it's just, it's not there, if I'm being honest with you. So most of the people there, you know, uh, especially if you're going in there and you're vulnerable as well, it ends up exacerbating uh, like mental health issues. You know, I've seen a lot of people that have uh, cut themselves to pieces because they have uh, no uh, nourishing environment or anything uh, nourishing to do. From my point of view, I think it would be uh, ben very beneficial to have meaningful use of time, like with art, stuff like that, you know. Prisoners are people, and they've got talents. Well, there's, there's a hell of a lot of uh, untapped talent because a lot of people go in there broken, you know, so anything that would be able to either make them feel uh, useful to society again and also uh, not looked down as like uh, excess baggage to be left. Why, are, why incarcerate people? Why put people in prisons if there is no, no rehabilitation in the way that Dan's saying? If, 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 if people are being put into prisons and then coming out and reoffending and going back in, what is the point of prisons? But don't get me going on the vast issue of sentencing policy or should we do things differently? It's worth saying that actually despite all the gloom, all the negatives, there are a few positives. And Dan, frankly, is one of them. Uh, he's come out of prison, he's rebuilding his life, he's on a journey, but most people are in the glooms and despair, and there's nothing for them to do. They say there's a uh, £40,000 per year funding for each prisoner to get put in prison behind the door for 23 hours a day. And if you look at it, value for money, it's, it's not there, you know? I mean, it's just not. What about the wall space in Penville? There is a lot of it, isn't it? What? Yes, there is. There is a lot of wall space. And I believe a bit of art would uh, make the environment more bearable. Penville is a desert as far as art is concerned. But one or two prisoners have art workshops. And from time to time, as I go around to prisons, people give me things. Now, here's a present I was given. Try and hold it up. These are a couple of bookends, and they were carved. They're rather good, I'm not doing justice to them, but they were carved by a prisoner in Brixton who with great pride gave them to me. And um, then here's a picture which I was presented with at Oakwood, uh, a prison near Birmingham. That's done by, as a prison art. Uh, and um, it's an example of what does go on. And the prisoners themselves, uh, I was, I was rather moved. They presented them to me as though they were handing over the crown jewels. They've achieved something. They've done it and long to give it to somebody. We have none of that in Pendleville. You look at that uh, picture and uh, 
you can see the amount of effort and time that's gone into it and uh, the amount of time that it would have taken back in their cell to do the art, you know, and uh, to preoccupy them and give them meaningful use of time would be quite considerable. Jonathan, just to be clear, were those as a result of like sort of structured programmes in which prisoners would, would make work in with, as, as Dan was saying, with, with somebody, with, with a teacher, with somebody who was actually helping them through the practicalities? Yeah, all prisons are different, and they have slightly different regimes. We know it works, and the project we're talking about at Pentonville is if we could have enough funding to employ a couple of part-time instructors, art instructors, and some materials, and say, now this is how you do a mural. It would be enthusiastically um, supported by the prisoners. Prison officers are all ready for it. Um, as the governor is all ready for it, we would just love to get this off the ground and make a big difference. There are charities, there are organisations, people like Kerstler Arts, for instance, that, that, that work with prisoners in, 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 with the very aim of improving their lives through making art. Why is it that certain, why is it that certain um, prisons seem not to have access to that help and others do? But it's like all these charities, um, a small drop in the bucket compared to what is needed. Is it just quite simply that there will not be government money that will go towards helping prisoners be creative? Well, government money and prisoners, the prisons on the whole are two different worlds. Uh, prison is very short of money, so it's really always had to be done by the private sector. So effectively you're calling for sort of charitable donations which will allow you to put such a programme in place? Absolutely. I mean, Think imaginatively, a little money on brushes, paint, and an instructor to encourage people how to do it. You think you've got over a thousand prisoners, and most of the time they're locked in a cell for 23 hours a day. So if you have somebody there that's willing to train them, give them guidance, and make their environment better, it's going to have two things. It's going to help them with their mental health, and it's going to help them with their confidence. That's just the basics. Dan's pointed out there's a lot of people together, all of whom are wanting to, to do more things to keep them occupied. That's a, a huge, um, there's huge potential in that to be put to use to decorate that space, to make that space, a, 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 even if it's not making artworks, as you say, murals, painting the walls, to just to make the space more amenable to human life is, 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 is not that ambitious an aim, is it? An absolutely obvious thing to do in a way, just it hasn't been done. I was a prisoner myself, serving 18 months for perjury 20 years ago. And one thing I learned, and I often tell people this, that coming out of prison is harder than going into prison. Sounds a rather odd thing to say, but it is true. And why? Because when you come out of prison, your confidence is a very low ebb. Uh, low self-esteem is a big problem in a prison. But a man who's done a mural or made bookends like the kind I showed you a few minutes ago, he's usually a man who's at least got some self-esteem, says, well, I can paint. I, I do paint and decorate on the outside, obviously, in the community. And uh, my confidence uh, through doing that in the community has gone through the roof. And the result of that is I've not went around the same circles I used to hang around with, you know, and I've withdrew away from that and now I'm flourishing. One of the things that's clear from what you've just said, Dan, and Jonathan, I'm sure that this this is something you've experienced many times, is is that art has a tr transformative power. <laughs> this is one of the things it does to us all. Art is transforming and people who are very low, it takes very little to transform them quite a bit. I think one of the things that we haven't talked about is, is, is that art made by prisoners does, when it's exhibited, also has a very powerful effect. And that's a tremendously important thing because it gives the opportunity for viewers to encounter the thoughts, dreams, ideas of people who are in prisons and to profoundly humanise those people. Because apart from anything else, so much of the language around prisoners is is dehumanising and it doesn't treat people that, that have problems as we've established with any level of dignity. Very much so. I um, do make a point of trying to go to prisoners' art exhibitions, which there are one or two, um, certainly in London every year. Jonathan and Dan, thank you so much for talking to us today. This has been a really fascinating conversation, so thank you both very much. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. I'd like to say thank you as well. Thank you. Thanks. Hello, Ben, and welcome to the Center for the Less Good Idea. Hey William and Pella, nice to see you. You're at the Centre for the Less Good Idea. What is the Centre for the Less Good Idea? The, the, the Centre for the Less Good Idea is a centre in which artists, theatre makers, filmmakers, composers, choreographers, dancers are invited to come together and work out the energy that comes from working across disciplines and also from working where an outcome is not necessarily known in advance, where you're open to the less good ideas emerging from the edges of a project and taking center space. It's a get, privileging the periphery. Can you, say, can you say more about how that works in practice? The idea at the center is to, to really get away from you know, the headspace in terms of the theory of things you know, and work through material, putting things on the floor and, and making sure that you know the, the the work and the way of doing tells you what to do as opposed to philosophizing about it and over analyzing you know ideas because in that way you know when you have a good idea sometimes if it stays there you're forcing something that you know um cannot happen or that collapses and is too the, the name of the center the center for the less good idea comes from a Tswana proverb which says that if the good doctor can't cure you find the less good doctor you need ideas that come from the edge. It's also about saying Johannesburg is not the center of an art world, but the periphery and things that can come from the periphery can really change and alter what is, what is thought of in the center. And, and the, the thing that is important to also know about the center is that, I mean, this is also based on collective you know, uh, uh, practice where collaboration is key. You know, um, in in doing that, and also understanding that you know uh, the the collective has much more you know uh, contribution and voices when people come together and energize the space as opposed to just the the individual. This idea of play and 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 exploring ideas on the periphery of the original idea it seems to me is crucial in terms of that limiting that ability that you can have as a creator to be too fastidiously focused on a kind of self-conscious idea of what it, the outcome should be. Can you say more about that? Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the thing about, you know, um, work is that the moment you put, you know, a, 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 and you hang on to a grand idea about the work, that becomes an obstacle in, in you know, trying to make the work itself. So whenever you get into um, work with an open mind of, you know, what the work can be, and, and also with an acknowledgement that because you are working with other people, they also have ideas, and that your ego must, you know, be on the side, and that the work must, you know, take, you know, the center space, then that becomes, you know, a fruitful way of, of working. You know, it's the healing, it's the process of healing, it's the process of unwinding and vulnerability, you know, so there are so many elements, you know, that come into play when one puts work, you know, and works through, you know, material in, in the space. I mean, for all of us who were locked down for, and have been in, still in different stages of lockdown over the years, the relief when we gathered at different times to start working again, to say, oh, we're not just alone in a house. Hmm. There's other musicians, the kind of the, for all of us who are doing it. I mean, I certainly felt it for myself, and I'm sure for other, yeah. other true, practitioners, true. to be allowed to practice. I mean, one of the hardest things for, you know, as a visual artist, it's been relatively easy. I have my studio, I can go and make my drawings in it. But for all our colleagues who are musicians, dancers, actors, who've not even been able to practice their metier this last year, has been calamitous, has been very, very, very hard, both financially but also psychically. Yeah. Can you say something about who the people are that take part in the programme? Who are these, part, uh, these practitioners that you're talking about? So basically, um, we've worked with a number of, you know, uh, artists from, you know, South Africa, and, and we do have a few international, you know, people. But basically, the community 
of artists is every artist is welcome at the center um, and we're, the way in which we work is that you know at the beginning when you have a curator who invites you know a person that they want to work with and then that person invites another person that they, they would like to work with and now we have got a community of over you know uh, close to 600 people basically we embraced you know a little bit of ne nepotism you know a little bit of favoritism you know has gotten us to where where we are because you know, it's about the network of people that you know, and some, sometimes it's somebody who you want to work with that you invite in, you know, and yeah. that has been the basic way yeah. of connecting and building a community. But largely our people come from, you know, Johannesburg, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's also the, the range. They're from people who are very senior actors. So they're both there as actors. So there's very strong mentors as teachers for people who are just out of theater school, for mid-career actors. The same with musicians. We have Kyle Shepard, a top jazz pianist in the world, who's done concerts here and then improvised with other musicians. Um, we've got musicians who've never played before who come together, like Mika and Volley, and suddenly are an extraordinary duo that continues and has a, uh, an extraordinary presence. So it's a, it's a real... It's a range. I mean, it has the d demographics of South Africa. The, the way it works, the principle is that the curators change each season and they can invite the performers they want to, to do in it. D does it have a sort of um, uh, structured uh, community outreach or educational program? In, in other words, are you extending into the community around the centre or how, mu or how much is a sort of self-selecting element? No, we're saying that the community of artists, of which there are many, many thousands, is the central community of it. If you look over the years, there have been many, many different communities, but its focus is not saying that is its direction. Its direction are the thousands of artists, and that is the that is our central community. You know, in our sixth season, we had a very big pro procession with, you know, Congolese uh, funeral uh, dancers and uh, a, a Congolese, you know, brass band. We had Pantola dancers, we had Dinaka dancers, which is, a, you know, a CPD kind of an art form. So we, we invaded, you know, the, si the city in a, in a way, you know, parts of, you know, the areas around here. <laughs> You know, for us, it has to be organic, natural, and it has to be, you know, led by the artists wanting to do something, as opposed to being enforced as a requirement. Right. And you talked about he you talked about healing earlier on, and it seems to me that one of the crucial things that I think will emerge from these discussions that we're having today is the act of making is a healing act to a certain degree. And I wonder if you might say something. I think it's, yeah, I think it's, it is. I think there's a sense of agency of going from silence into your voice, of, you know, of not making a sound to being singing. There's a sense of possibility in the world. When you start with an empty stage and two people confront each other in an action a conflict, uh, something starts to happen. There's a sense of being alive in your body, in the focus you have to have. And... It's both a demonstration of what agency is, and it's an example of it. So it's both a, meta a metaphor and a physical, practical oh, example. You, you, you talked already, William, about, about the demands and the you know, terrific hardships actually experienced by performers over the last year. What has the centre been able to do in the last year through lockdowns and through this crisis? We've had, we had one, one project, one big project, Ask him a radical rethinking of Waiting for Godot, which had to do with re-examining the political connectedness of come, Samuel Beckett. Come back tomorrow. And the day after tomorrow? Possibly. But we also had projects which were possible to do long distance. So we had a series of one-minute films that people made either on their cell phones or other. We had over 100 different films that were made and showed on our website and on our Instagram account. Then there was a project also saying, how can we do something that's not just digital, but that involves social distancing. And this is a series of billboard, which are collaborations between poets and artists making signs which are on 18 meter long billboards over the highway. One of the projects that you know we did was a, what we called a considered three minutes, which was basically, you know, um, a, it was part of the elongation of some of the long minutes project that we liked and thought that, you know, they needed a little bit more, you know, to of space, you know, uh, to tell the story. And then the odd portraits of, portraits of Johannesburg is basically performances that will be happening in some spaces, found spaces around, you know, uh, the, the city. 
and and it will be shown yeah on and it will be shown on Instagram and on YouTube and on, on our YouTube. Facebook. Um, just to return to the Highway Notice project, there was one it seemed to me that was ter terrifically emblematic, and it was one of your blue rubrics, William, which said simply "Breathe." Did the three breaths that were in the air last year. The one was when the piece was done, it was uh, just after when Black Lives Matter started growing in the United States. And then of course in the pandemic, it's all the people who are dying from drowning in their lungs where they cannot breathe. But it also has to do, as you say, with the whole ecosystem being able to breathe, to understand breath as, a, as an active and necessary part of living. So it, it was able to take all the different associations of the of the moment. And, but, but I mean, it speaks to a kind of need for a kind of intersectional thinking, right? Um, the thing that, you know, with the centre, at least we, you know, we, we know and understand that we, we have freed ourselves from the responsibility of thinking that, you know, art should, you know, always be about other and not ourselves. You know, so art here is made by the artists for the artists, you know, for other people. But, you know, the central thing is building that community and making sure that we, we do not switch off the light of, you know, people who want to do work and do, are not, you know, um, doing work because they are funded by somebody who wants to tick, you know, certain kind of, you know, boxes. You know, the, the first billboard of, you know, Williams of St. Breathe is that also the art needs to breathe. It needs spaces where it is not, you know, normally occupying and, and, and that. So the, it was quite a nice metaphor about, you know, giving it a new breath as well. Mm. I mean, the thing that I like to say, you know, uh, Ben, is that we have allowed science to advance, you know, for uh, science to advance itself on failure and elimination of failure. That's what we call experiment. That's what labs are for, you know. And then we, 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 on the other hand, expect art to be perfect and not to advance itself on the very same kind of elements, you know, of, of failure and eliminating failure. And the Center for the Less Good Idea is a typical example of, you know, a lab where we are looking at, you know, different ways of, you know, uh, the art advancing itself or, you know, uh, and, and, and based on a simple, you know, principle of a less good idea. You know, so the, the science is always looking for eliminating, you know, ideas until they find the right kind of a thing. Right now we're talking about, you know, the COVID, you know, uh, vaccine. There's some COVID vaccine here in South Africa which has arrived and it's not working because the, the disease itself has advanced. You know, and then now they found, oh, this one can respond. And that's basically, you know, the failures and the successes of, of you know, science. And even in the art in the same, we will always get, you know, things that work and sometimes things that don't work and it is fine. Now, we're, we're terrifically privileged today because you're actually going to give us access to a new work made by the centre. So, so can you tell us a bit about it? The work is called Uhambo Imizwa Nomsindo, which, you know, uh, literally translates, you know, the journey... Um, feelings and noise. You know, um, 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 umsindo could mean sound, you know, it can also mean noise. So um, it is led by Sibusi Soshozi. It, you know, um, it has Mika, uh, Manganye, uh, Volincha Beleng, it has uh, Dikele Dumudubu, and uh, Freedom Swani, and who else? Musa. Boweni, yes. So, um, yeah, I hope that I've, I've actually, you know, uh, included everybody. So it's an exploration of the gift of song and spirituality and the gift of story in, in you know, uh, through song. Basically, uh, it's a song that has been sung generation to generation from, you know, uh, his family, you know, and he had, you know, a single phrase of the song that he then, you know, uh, began to develop with others, with the input of others, what it means for them.
William and Pella, that was just such an amazing performance. So thank you for sharing it with us and goodbye. Thank you so much for this extraordinary experience. Thank you for being with us then. Till next time. Hi, Hannes. It's, it's great to see you. Ben, wonderful seeing you. How are you? And, uh, and Hans, wonderful to see you. Hi, Ben. Hi, Hannes. It's great to see you. Hannes, I'm going to hand over to Hans Ulrich soon, but just to link these conversations within the context of the healing arts, I wanted to ask you about how the last year has affected the practice of architecture. We all of a sudden lost uh, a certain kind of traction, a certain kind of habitual way of working, run of the mill way almost in terms of just, just you know, the rigmarole of it. Um, and all of a sudden this, this crazy vacuum, and then we find ourselves uh, in a very different situation where it was much more meditative and, uh, and insular across the whole profession. I've watched a sort of leveling and a back to basics aspect uh, that's actually been extremely healthy for the, for the professional architecture. Um, we've, we've gotten to ask very serious questions again um, about why we do what we do. Dealing with clients and dealing globally has become a much uh, more efficient uh, situation. We don't waste a lot of time um, and a lot of carbon um, you know, moving around and, and, and it, we get to the point. And that's, that's been interesting. To what extent was mental health and the consideration of mental health built into the architectural process anyway? Years ago, we did a, a fascinating installation piece at Castle at Documenta 11 with Oakley around the themes of, of Jona Friedman and, and Constant, who were great figures in our, in our discipline and great historical characters. It was an augmented reality piece. And we took a, a mirrored room, we, we mirrored the room ourselves, we built out a room, and we put these kind of strange tubes in the room and we projected video that would actually allow these tubes to turn. We didn't think about it in terms of mental health, but what it was was, could we sample, could we create kind of video derive, uh, derives of major urban metropoli and capture somehow the phonetic madness of these places, the, the behaviors within high-end modernist uh, landscapes. And so we took Tokyo, Hong Kong, New York. People uh, sampled voices in elevators of people speaking to each other in dialogue. Um, and then we took those voices and sampled them and then resampled them into a, into a sound piece, used them as, and had the projection of these cities play those um, symphonies. And what came out was a kind of really interesting uh, set of musical, kind of Cajun musical scores that um, that picked up on something of the behaviors of these places urbanistically. And ever since then, I've always thought that uh, cities and the way we design cities have an amazing impact on mental health um, and on the way we think and the way that we act. I think in, in an abstract way, um, urbanism and mental health has always had an intrinsic uh, link. Um, and I think as architects, most of us would believe in, in the sort of doctrines of people like Vitruvius who said that, you know, beautiful cities make for beautiful people. It's interesting that this idea of beauty in, in a larger context, and that comes into art and music, um, can actually act uh, in a positive way for the people who experience it. And I think architecture is not immune to that. You know, uh, a well-designed city, a well-designed uh, urbanism, a well-designed well -designed architecture, probably has a great deal to do with betterment. That's great. But at this point, I'm going to hand over the baton to Hans Ulrich. And I know that this is a continuing conversation, isn't it? This isn't, this is by far means not the first conversation you guys have had. So I'm going to hand over and let you continue your fascinating conversation now. Thanks guys. See you soon. Wonderful. Thank you. Ben. It's great to see you again. I think we, we met exactly 30 years ago and I always remember the journey to the Engadin to Pontresina mind-blowing experience and I've, I've thought often about all those things that we covered in that three-hour drive <laughs> and today uh, as ben said we're going to talk about architecture and of course the uh importance also of uh architecture giving hope i mean Gerhard richter once said that painting art is the highest form of hope and i suppose we can say that also for architecture and you have often talked about that and uh in relation also to uh, of course, the big theme of, of mental health, uh, you've actually referred to, to history, that there is a long history in a way for many, many centuries. You mentioned Vitruvius, um, who already talked about dignity, beauty in relation to cities. Can you talk a little bit more following up on what Ben and you discussed about this long history? Always been uh, an absolute uh, parameter for us as architects historically to, to work uh, on, on 
architecture and its kind of symbiotic relationship to the, to the human condition. You can cite Vitruvius as you just did, and we just did, um, but we can also go all the way up to Corbusier and discuss, you know, uh, Plan Voisin and, you know, green, green cities and the notion of sort of building in the park. We can look even now into the contemporary uh, sort of, uh, let's say, uh, obsessions and interests we have as architects of, of really trying to find ways of creating uh, healthier, more sustainable, uh, sort of smarter, more intelligent architecture, even utilizing technology. So I think there's a fantastic continuum from um, the sort of, let's say, the birth of architecture, the, the primordial hut, if you will, all the way to, uh, to, to the world we're in today. We are absolutely committed to um, trying to understand and, and envelop and create for uh, uh, environments for the human condition in, in all of its kind of facets. So mental health is by far one of the, one of the major facets there, if not, if not one of the primary ones. There is a long history and of course at the same time there is a new urgency, emergency actually of the issue of mental health in relation to the isolation, to to the lack, no, of of togetherness of, of the last um, twelve months, and I was wondering, kind of, how with your architecture practice, you answered or can answer to such an emergency. How how did the way you work change? One starts to realize the absurdity of uh, some of the things we took for granted as architects in terms of um, you know large gathering spaces. Uh, uh, the, the, the airports, it's one of my pet peeves and one of my pet sort of just, you know, sort of obsessions these days. I mean, the obsolescence of the airport to me is fascinating because you have places like Fraport or Frankfurt Airport, which is a, it's basically a city onto itself. How do these spaces now reconfigure themselves according to, um, you know, some of the things that we've now picked up from this COVID experience that are valuable to us as human beings? And social distancing and, and things like that is part of it. But what's really more important is uh, the notion of, of, of healthy, uh, sort of uh, accessible and, and, and scaled environments uh, in which we can uh, basically operate and, and, and work in and desire, desire to, um, uh, to be part of the architecture, desire to uh, sort of, you know, co coexist. Uh, with your city and with your buildings, um, those 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 things we've we've taken for granted, and and in fact, to tell you the truth, it, it all sort of came to the surface in a very powerful way now. Because you have to also ask yourself about the relevancy of certain kinds of buildings in 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 the uh, aftermath of this, uh, and and we start with typical things like office space, uh, but also uh, the domestic space is going to change dramatically. Uh, we we have an entirely different relationship to domestic space now. I want to ask you, Tim. Me a little bit more 30 years after about your interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary pursuit, the importance of it to address these big questions where you see it now. I was thinking this morning, there's this fantastic book called Asa da Fe by Kennedy. And in, in the book, Kennedy describes this character who walks through the library and has an amazing library and, and has discussions with Dostoevsky and with Husserl and with Kant and has these, you know, fantastic kind of dialogues with these ghosts, uh, these authors of these books in his library. And I was thinking that that's really, for me as an architect, I'm living in, I, I, I exist in a kind of auto da fe uh, world with artists. So we're working at the moment on a project in, in, um, in Hungary. And we've become extremely interested in the op art, uh, in the history of op art, and, and the way op art has come to us through uh, through Hungary, uh, through Vasarely and others, um, and how it kind of you know through through the kind of conduit of Paris, um, and 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 the question we've had as architects is is, is the sort of psychological landscape that. Um, that that art has allowed us to, that, that it performs and how it performs optically. And can it in fact raise one's kind of psyche and spirit by virtue of being inside the, uh, the sort of, let's say the kind of spatiality of op art. And, and we've become actually pretty obsessed with it. Um, and we've been building these kind of crazy op art inspired structures. And the thing that's been interesting is, is you know, and it goes back to the mental health thing in, in a kind of peripheral way, but the, the sense of well-being and the sense of centeredness and the sense of understanding ironically can be manifest with things like um, uh, spaces that are optically, um, you know, sort of playful and are, and are dealing with phenomenological things that we, we didn't quite understand before. And, and one of the things that I cite when I think about that is that 
there's been studies made that you know people feel literally feel better in forests, right? That that you are in a in a natural landscape. Uh, I know you're in Switzerland, so you you know this uh, better than anyone. But it's and and the question is, what is it? So of course, the scientific side of that is the scientists will tell you that it's the oscillation of the trees and the glint, the glints of light and the kind of you know the, and the general kind of atmospheric uh, thing. But the artists might say um, that it's actually uh, the fragmentation of light uh, and the disconcerting nature of, of being um, uh, in a kind of a um, oscillating, ever-changing liquid environment, right? Those are kind of more artistic ways of describing that. And to me, that's, that's really the, the, the crux of it is to find a way to say, well, how do we then in the built environment create things that mimic motive sort of Kind of understanding of spatiality when when you can sort of replay and i think that's what we discovered in op art op art actually is nature it's actually uh nature manifest in geometry and it's fascinating honey you mentioned actually three things which are important cities overcrowding the repeating of and a cookie cutter mentality as it applies to places for incarceration hospitalization and the aging. This is a quote uh, from a text you wrote. Um, and you said that these three aspects of the built environment are in dire need, or one could even say in urgent need, no? Of complete overhaul and total rethinking. Can you talk a little bit about that? Places of incarceration, um, places of hospitalization, and the way we deal with the aging, aging in our society are, are three things that we have, you know, neglected, honestly. And the qualitative is very, very important. And I think would bring a, a massive upgrade to, uh, to those kinds of places if in fact, architects were asked to work on them from the point of view of, of what is it to make these places human? I think the question is when we talk about, um, about prisons is, 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 is of course also the idea of abolishing prisons. The idea there is not so much to design yet another prison or another prison paradigm or an efficient prison, but, but, but how not to design, how to design non-prisons. Uh, in other words, can we get to a point where we could design things that would serve what prisons are supposed to serve, which is uh, the, the sort of betterment of the human being, the, 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 the reform, the, you know, bringing them back to uh, some semblance of, of normalcy or whatever that is. Um, and rather than uh, where we're, the road we've been going down for a long, long time, centuries, uh, is, is this idea of confinement and closure and, uh, and, and somehow that that's going to uh, solve the problem and all it does is increase the problem. So you're absolutely right. I mean, the abolishment of prisons is the sort of utopian ideal, but somewhere in there uh, to, to meet that ideal, I think we have to start to really think about the, the design of non-prison prisons. How can hospitals be reinvented? How, how do you see that? So we, we became very interested in that. We did a big research studio at the Angavante in Vienna with my, with my students there. And, and what we discovered, one of the biggest things we discovered about hospitals is that they need to be um, atomized, for lack of a better word. Um, and by atomized, I mean that we have to move away from sort of the singular uh, institution, um, the, the sort of, you know, the big building block, the hospital, uh, be it in the city or outside of the city. Um, to things that are much more to do with cl clinic-like approach, uh, and, and, but to do sort of micro-hospitals that are interconnected. The thing that became really interesting in the, during the pandemic here in New York, hospitals couldn't communicate with each other. Uh, there were people, too many beds in one place that were available, and there were no beds and people were being turned away in another place, but nobody had a way of sort of monitoring uh, the whole sort of ecosystem of the hospital landscape. It's really interesting when it comes to architecture because it means you know, how do you then uh, start to create this kind of fragmented, atomized hospital situation that's spread across large urban centers? In terms of what we discussed tonight, uh, in general reading, I felt also that the theme of empathy is really important. And uh, Roman Kachanik did a great TED talk and also wrote a book about how we can actually turn empathy into a form of social action. Um, uh, the idea also um, actually um, of empathy uh, being a spark of, uh, of curiosity. How do you see the, the importance of empathy for, for architecture? I think it's probably one of the most important attributes you can have uh, as an architect is to be extremely empathetic. And I think it's also 
um, something that has to be sort of built into the very DNA of every project we do is, is, is the notion of, of, of being conscious of the other, um, conscious of the user, conscious of the, um, you know, you can extrapolate it from the individual to, 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 to the city, to city space, to communities. Bernard Stiegler once told me the question is really, how can we be local? Comment peut-on être local sans être localiste, no? So the late philosopher Bernard Stiegler would ask, comment peut-on être local? sans être localiste. How can we be local without being localist? And that, of course, has a lot to do with the late Edouard Glissant, the amazing poet and writer, philosopher, Martinique, who, who, who was my mentor, with whom I spent a lot of time the last couple of days of, uh, last couple of years, actually, of his life. And we actually discussed a few weeks ago with uh, Mantia Diavara, um, the artist and scholar, about this idea of being rooted, you know, about the local. And that actually, as the Avara says, for Glissant, being rooted in a culture, in a context, is important, but it's only important as long as it does not lead to the exclusion or annihilation of other people's roots, as long as it does not lead to the hierarchization and election of some roots or cultures over others. So Glissant sort of taught us that we need to celebrate roots that expand elsewhere, roots that touch each other, they are not singular roots, they are roots that cover and protect some others. And I think that's a really important point in terms of Glissant, because of course, what we could see a lot in the last 12 months are new forms of localism and increased nationalisms. No? So I wanted to ask you about, about that in relation to, to architecture. You know, in my own personal life, uh, my, own, my own persona, you know, being born in Cairo, um, you know, being to a British mother, an Egyptian father, you know, living, going to school in Algeria and London, in Rome, eventually in Canada and Toronto, uh, you know, uh, and, and growing up, uh, I think it made me extremely um, sensitized to local conditions, but it's made me very, very aware of the, of the uh, let's say, the kind of schism and, and the um, sort of doubling of local global uh, oscillation, let's say. Um, and I think that the, the ability to um, sort of dive in deep locally and understand the best you can philosophically, conceptually, artistically, um, you know, even scientifically a condition, and at the same time be able to come out of that and look at it with a larger lens uh, and bring to it other attributes from, from other cultures or other places and kind of try and find the mix, the correct mix is really the key to um, all of us moving forward in the world. I remember many years ago, I was in Portugal. I went to see the, the late architect Guedes, a Portuguese architect who basically was in his late 80s, early 90s, and the majority of his life was active in, in Africa. And he sort of told me he believes that we need an architecture of open source. He basically said anybody could just come to, to him and he sort of would give a scar, no? he would give a, a partition, he would, he would sort of... Uh, give a set of instructions. As you know, it's something I've been very interested in art because we collaborated on Do It, uh, an exhibition made out of instructions, how-to manuals, uh, recipes. Um, in design, we have, of course, the legendary Enzo Mari, who passed away last year, and I curated a retrospective of his together with Francesca Giacomelli for the Triennale in Milano. Relevant in terms of Mari, of course, also his insistence on long duration, his insistence that you know objects have to last because of sustainability, but so important and so relevant for now, of course, his auto progettazione, where he wanted to transmit knowledge through instructions, and everybody can just build the table or do the table. So I was kind of wondering, I mean, because of gets us also to the question of open source, because if it's do it in terms of my exhibition, or if it's um, Enzo Mari's auto progettazione. Anyone could just do it. And it was very fascinating how actually during the lockdown, during the month of the lockdowns of 20 and 21, actually um, many people started to download again the do it instruction, just did it, no? Because it sort of liberated them from the two dimensions of the screen and people could just do um, a Franz West piece or a Louis Bourgeois piece uh, or a Theasta Gates piece in a DIY way. Or as a matter of fact, your do it piece, which you created, which maybe you can tell us about. So I want to ask you, tell us a little bit about that, that about this idea of architecture as open source, 
If you and I taught a course on open source cities at that Bauhaus, I would be thrilled. I mean, the idea of actually, you know, and bringing in other experts to actually design templates um, and notions for the future of our planet and, and its urbanism is kind of, it's, ne we ne it's necessary. We should, we need to do it. We need to find, because at the moment, the fiefdoms and the kind of ownership over ideas, and particularly by big tech companies, um, you know, is, is kind of a, to, is the opposite of what you're talking about, right? Everything is IP, everything is owned, everything is kind of uh, coveted. But the idea that you actually could enter those things into a mix and produce templates for everything from, from mobility to, um, to uh, back to the problem of incarceration, even back to the problem of, of sort of hospitals, um, open source urbanism, open source city design to me would be, um, but, but I guess the reason why it's interesting in the Bauhaus context that you asked about earlier is that as an individual, you can do it. Uh, you know, I could, I could sit here and say, okay, you know what, we're going we're gonna to design an open source city and just put it out there. Um, but I think if you have it as a kind of a, a collective, I always was fascinated uh, by a project that I saw as a kid. It was called the Pavilion and it was built in Expo 67. Um, and I believe that Joseph Boyce was part of it. I believe that Rauschenberg was part of it. Um, and what fascinated me about that pavilion, that, that project historically, and there were about 25 artists, is that it was an open source of this kind of amazing, vibrant um, vision of the future of architecture and, and even maybe to some extent art uh, and media uh, in, in, with this group of artists, this group of this collective uh, that worked together. And I, I think that it's, you know, we need a pavilion. Uh, we need something in, in this time period where people put down their swords um, and kind of enter into a into a place where um, they can explore uh, the, the the future of our of our world. Because, quite frankly, it's we're almost in dire need of that now. It's it's not so much an option. I'll give one small story before I leave you, which is, we did a project in Shangsha, China, uh, a couple of years ago, maybe seven years ago now, and it was for a city of the future. That was the commission. We did this project where we, we got, lit, got rid of all fossil fuel vehicles, burning vehicles, we got rid of uh, all the sort of, you know, we, we cleaned it up and it became a kind of, it was back to plan Gauzin, back to certain ideas about living in, in nature. Um, presented in China, and to make a long story short, we, we got nothing but silence after the project had been shown. Um, and then six months later, we got a call from the, from the client, the client representative and said, our boss liked your project, but the problem is, is that he didn't think it looked like a city. And we said, well, what does a city look like? Is that Chicago? We want Chicago. So, you know, I think that that tells you a little bit about the, um, the issue of, of building uh, really innovative new environments um, and, and, and open sourcing um, our information to that and getting to that level with, that's going to hit against, in the private sector at least, resistance by virtue of what people expect from, from, from architecture. Not be a better conclusion, honey. Thank you so, so much. Well, thank you, Hans. Fantastic and fantastic to see you. Thank you everyone for joining us on these journeys behind the scenes into artist studios. And don't forget that this is a week-long programme, so do join us for the rest of Healing Arts London. <laughs>